Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's live stream, Gearbox 2.0, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy that you're here. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before we start this episode. First, let's just acknowledge that there is a tremendous amount of things going on in the world, many of them which I am not happy about. But this site and the content that I create here is not about politics. It's not about um, anything but the craft of video production and filmmaking and conversations related to that. So hopefully this hour and the hour later today for Cameron Flask are going to be about conversations about how you get better at what you're doing as a content creator, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker. And uh, to that end, please, please, if you haven't yet checked out my new series, Conversations, take a look at that. Uh, started off with Matt Porwall, who is a documentary cinematographer, and then another cinematographer, Scott Ressler, which turned out to be two episodes last week and the week before. And there's some great information from both of them about not only their careers, but how they approach craft and how they approach what they do for a living. A uh, little hello to David here in the chat. I will be keeping my eye out on that. And today we are going to be talking about some stuff. It's going to get messy because one of the things that I'm trying to do here is start to work out how I'm going to be doing educational content live on the channel. So I'm doing that on a very small scale today with this particular live stream. I want the chat to be lively, so if there are people here, please come over uh, and into and start the conversation with the chat. I am also just going to fire up the watch page here and make sure that I can see that I'm getting a feed and that everything's okay and it seems to be all right and if anybody's in the chat and can let me know if it's all right that'll be great um and we're going to sort of get into some stuff here so like I said it's going to be a little bit messy today it's not going to be your standard kind of straight uh forward stuff and I'm also realizing that uh, if I don't log in through, yeah, there we go. I think we're okay. So uh, let's talk. Let's go over some stuff and kind of start to talk a little bit about specialty lenses and where and when you might want to start thinking about them. And though the title says this is about Fujifilm, it's not really just about Fujifilm. It's really about thinking about using lenses that you can um, use in your productions, whoa, hopefully <laughs> with better autofocus, and, uh, and, and, you know, when you might want to think about those, because different people will gravitate to using different lenses for different reasons. Obviously, if you're going into a production, and I would say that if you're in the corporate world, one of the most common things to do is to use a zoom lens. It gives you the ability to quickly and easily change focal lengths. It will allow you to, um, you know, if you're using it, let's say, in an interview situation, use it as a variable prime, which essentially means that you're not seeing the change in focal length within a shot. So you're starting an interview with somebody at, let's say, on your A camera, at a 28 millimeter focal length, it might be a wider shot, you're seeing a little bit more of the space. Um, maybe they're sitting down and you're seeing just below the knee line, you can see all of their movement and their action. And then as the interview progresses, you start to, in between the questions that are asked, change that focal length and go to um, a longer focal length. So, David just got the uh, 16 to 35 F2 recommended, uh, that I recommended, loves it, that's great. Um, very versatile lens, great focal range, and definitely something that would be beneficial in your toolkit. A lot of people will use on both APS-C slash Super 35 millimeter sensors and also full frame, the sort of, you know, the workhorse lens, which is the 24 to 105 
and there are equivalents in terms of field of view for smaller sensor cameras. They just don't have the same depth of field properties. But when you're trying to establish location, when you are, you know, in situations where you really want to feel like you're there with somebody, then wider focal lengths definitely can make a difference in terms of the way you feel that shot is. If you start to go telephoto, you start to get into sometimes what people will call a, a portrait focal length, let's say um, around 85 millimeters, and you go longer than that, the world starts to become more compressed. Generally, you may be further back from your subject matter, and you feel, as an audience member, more distanced from that person. It's almost like you're looking into it. And, and so that doesn't always translate into feeling like you're actually there. You feel like you're getting somebody's interpretation of being there. And it generally feels like there's a camera. So choosing focal length besides the characteristics of a lens is extremely important in terms of how you want to convey the space, the world, uh, the environment for what it is that you're shooting, whether that's documentary, corporate, narrative, doesn't matter what it is. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about a couple of focal lengths and a couple of lenses that I think do fall into that specialty uh, category, not character, category, because they are not the lenses that you're going to go and reach into your bag on a regular basis in order to get a particular um, sort of like day in, day out look and feel for what you're doing. They're lenses that you would be using for very specific purposes. So what I want to do is talk about those, and I'm going to talk about them in relationship to the Fujifilm ecosystem. But this first lens that's right here, which is the 9mm Laowa lens from Venus Optics, is also made in other lens mounts. And you can get this, for instance, in an E-mount. So you can use this same lens with similar, you know, uh, results on an E-mount. Uh, yes, I believe they do. But what you have to understand about the 9mm is that this is for APS-C Super 35mm camera systems. So Laowa uh, or Venus Optics, the Laowa um, lenses are also made in another focal length, which is 12 millimeters, which is essentially, for a full-frame camera, a similar field of view. The lens isn't quite as small, and it is designed for full-frame cameras. So what you do is you, you go to their website, and you figure out what camera system you have, and then if you're crop, then you could go with 9 millimeter. If you're full-frame, you go with 12 millimeter. Um, similar field of view. Obviously, there are going to be slight differences in terms of depth of field, properties because you're at a slightly longer focal length. And of course, if you took that 12 millimeter and you adapted it to a smaller sensor camera, it would still be a 12 millimeter lens. So you just have to remember all of those things. Um, F2.8 in terms of widest aperture, it's a manual focus lens. So there's no lens data being passed in this case to the X-T4. Um, and I think what I want to do is just sort of first talk about how I would set this lens up inside of this camera system. You can do similar things if you're using a different camera system. And I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. So let me just turn on the camera. I'll turn on this monitor because I have a pass-through going to the A10 Mini, which will allow me to show you things. And like I said, full disclaimer, it's going to be messy in this one. So let's just get through it, ask questions. I see that there's some people here. The chat is open for questions, and hopefully I can answer some of those. So I'm going to go into the menu here, switch over so you can see that. And the first thing I want to talk about in relationship to this particular lens is IS modes. Whether you're using, well, a camera system that has uh, just any type of digital or in-body in image stabilization, what you want to do is you want to turn that off. And the reason that you want to turn that off 
is, in my opinion, from the tests that I've done, there's no advantage to turning on in-body stabilization when you're using a nine millimeter focal length of a lens. In fact, you're gonna create more problems than you are solve problems because of such a wide focal length and field of view. When you're moving that camera, you don't want that IBIS or that digital image stabilization to kick in because it's gonna start to compensate for your movements and I don't think you're gonna like the results. So that's the first thing that I would do is I would turn that off inside of your camera. And then the other thing that you wanna do if you have the option and you do in the Fuji cameras is you wanna go in and you wanna let the camera know, because in this case, this is not passing any lens data through, what focal length you're actually using for this particular lens. So I'm gonna go in here and go into focal lens setting and I'm gonna set this to, whoops, there we go, to nine millimeters. And then that's letting the camera know that that is the focal length that is attached to the camera. Um, as long as I don't step in the mess, David, maybe I will, maybe I'll do that on purpose. Okay, so looking into the corner here, so now we have that nine millimeter feed coming in. I don't have any other things set up in terms of the camera. It's pretty straightforward. And I could, if I wanted to on the Fujifilm camera, I can actually change the shutter speed to a 48th if I'm shooting at 24. And then we're gonna take this lens off of the camera. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take it around and just show you some visuals of what this lens looks like. Now, the thing to understand about this lens is it's what they call a zero D or zero distortion lens. So oftentimes when you're going with extremely wide lenses, um, the easiest way to explain that is a fisheye lens. What you'll see is what we call barrel distortion. And it gets really extreme to the point where it's, <laughs> it's an entire barrel, it's a circle, and you can, you know, in some fisheye lenses, it's just the big circle and you can sort of see, you know, the whole image wrapped on that circle. Not great for the flat earthers, but, you know, it works for us. And then if you go um, with other lenses, sometimes what you'll see is you'll see pin cushioning. Um, generally not with the wide lenses, but you can see that with certain lenses. So the idea behind zero distortion is you're minimizing or eliminating that type of distortion on the edges of the lens. And I have to say for a nine millimeter lens, which is extremely wide, they're doing a great job. This is not a fisheye lens in any way, shape or form. So let's go ahead and take this off of here. And then again, I'm checking questions, though I may step off and go somewhere else in the room, maybe over to those shelves behind me. I think my HDMI cable is enough. And you'll see there's that little lens. It's not quite as small as a pancake lens, but you have a stepped aperture on the side. Again, it's a 2.8 all the way to a 22. And one of the other huge features of this lens is the minimum focus distance, which is 4.7 inches. So, I mean, you can get this lens, it's not a macro lens per se, but you can get this lens extremely close to what you're shooting. In fact, it's not a macro lens, but let's go ahead and switch over here and we'll just take a look at how close this lens can get to things. And we're gonna take a look at that minimum focus distance here. And I am literally smashed up against the A10 mini here. And what's really fun about this is if I take this and I just go right up against a MacBook Pro here, you can see how incredible um, and incredibly close you can get. And this is a very different look and feel in terms of vantage point as far as what you're seeing. And as you can see here, if you look at the edges of the frame, it's really minimal in terms of that distortion, which is one of the reasons that I really love this lens. Um, and it's very, very useful. Let me just get this cup here. Again, 4.7 inches. I'm kind of eyeballing this right now. I should probably be looking at the, uh, the actual monitor itself. There we go. 
and I'm smashed right up against this dirty cup here with my espresso in it. And you can just see that it's really interesting in terms of the shots that you can get. And for me, where I see this lens kind of playing very much so is in tabletop style applications. So if I go over here, we're going to get a little wonky with color temperatures, but I don't mind. I'm going to embrace the warmth here. You can see how that is. And in fact, just for giggles here, I'm going to go in and turn on the IS mode and we can kind of see what's happening there. And to me, what can happen is sometimes it will compensate and I've had it kind of kick in. The digital image stabilization on this seems to possibly be better than just doing the straight IBIS. Um, and I think you might have seen that there right at the beginning when I switched over. It kind of jerked over in terms of the way it looked. And, you know, it's um, this is not like the probe lens from Laowa, which is also extremely interesting. But you can see because we can get so close to things, you can get these really interesting vantage points on what you're shooting. And so I think that that this lens, which is about $499 US, really is something to be considered as part of your kit. I don't generally shoot a lot of wide angle stuff when I am doing production. And I have found that this lens has been really liberating. It's making me look at things in a different way. So it's one of the reasons that I really like the lens a lot. That was not a drunk cam. It's early morning, David. Behave yourself. Uh, it's all good. All right. So any questions about this lens that you want to ask? Um, you know, I can talk about a couple more things related to the Laowa 9mm, but basically uh, construction of the lens is extremely good. In fact, I can turn off the camera and you can take a look at it. I'll lens this with something else so you can, and this will be sort of a, a eventually a segue into our next lens that we're going to be talking about. So I'm just going to throw the standard 50 weather resistant lens onto the X-T4 right now. And we can sort of take a look at this if the AF kicks in properly. Come on, Mr. AF. There we go. So that's the lens right there. Let's uh, point it a little bit to the light so you can sort of see what's going on. And you can see it's extremely small. That's with the lens hood. And well built, all metal construction. And seems to be a workhorse. I can't remember if they officially label it as weather resistant, but I have had it out in the rain and have not had any problems. That's not me saying go ahead and do that, but I would do it. And I think that it's uh, a well-made lens overall. I don't see any kind of weather resistant seal on the back. That's where I'd be a little bit concerned. But if it's not bucketing down and you just got a sprinkle, I think you'd be okay. They also call it the Sea Dreamer. Uh, 49 millimeter threading on the front. And speaking of that, one of the things that we should discuss also is ND because it is a lens that you may want to be using outside. You may want to use it um, during daylight. And I have found that when you are putting ND onto very, very wide angle lenses, wide focal lengths, that variable NDs can be very pl uh, problematic. They can be problematic. And you can see vignetting on the sides. And it didn't really matter which very ND I got for this particular lens it seemed like I had a problem with all of them. So in the end, what I wound up doing was I wound up getting a um, a 1.2, so that would be four stops of ND as a fixed. And this one's by Gobi. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, G-O-B-E. I'll add that if I remember to the description. The other stuff that we're talking about is in the description. And a four-stop ND, generally, if you're opening up to a 2.8, it 
in most situations outside, if you're lowering your ISO, which has advantages and disadvantages, which won't be part of today's discussion, is kind of a good starting point for me. I usually find that if I'm just putting um, two, even three stops of ND, that it's generally not enough for me to open up to a 2.8 and make adjustments with ISO to get where I want. But if I've got a four stop on there, it helps. I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to have a very ND where I could go up to six or eight stops of ND. But for video applications, um, a four stop or an ND64 would make a lot of sense in terms of an ND filter for a lens like this. So any questions at all coming in from the chat having to do with the nine millimeter Lawa zero distortion lens. Um, what if you use a 77 millimeter mar uh, very ND with a step up ring? Still a problem? It could be. I have done some step ups. In fact, the original very ND that I put on there was not a 49 millimeter. I stepped up to, what did I step? Uh, not a 52. I definitely went larger than 49. And it's still having a problem because it's such a wide focal length in terms of field of view that it's kind of seeing into and uh, kissing the adapter, the step up ring a little bit. Your mileage may vary, but I found that for this particular lens that that four stop was a good place to be. If I were going to pick two and I wasn't going to have a very ND, I'd probably put a six stop in here as well. Um, I don't find that I'm normally going to eight stops of ND. It's definitely something that let's say, let's say you're on a beach, uh, midday, you're up on a ski slope. You might do that for video applications. You're generally going to those much higher, um, stops of ND, especially in photography purposes. So what you want to do is you want to shoot at a very slow shutter speed, wide open, and uh, you want to do that kind of stuff. Obviously, you know, those are things that you have to consider. And when you are at a slower shutter speed, you're letting in more light into the camera. When you have a wider aperture, you're letting more light into the camera. And, you know, you want to take a photograph of a waterfall and or or any kind of moving object and you want it to, um, you know, feel that way, then it would make a lot of sense to get higher ND in terms of number of stops. But again, for video applications, I'm generally finding that for on the top end, eight stops of ND, there have been times when I'm shooting with Cinema EOS cameras where I do take advantage of that extended ND and I'll go to 10 stops, but it's generally in those um, situations that I mentioned before. You're in very high, bright, you know, sand, uh, light bouncing off of there, midday, lots of sunlight, uh, ski slope, you know, all white everywhere. Uh, situations like that where it, you know, in order to get the exposure that you want, you're going to need to go to those higher stops of neutral density. Um, good. And David says he's heard that Polar Pro makes great variable NDs. I haven't used any of theirs, heard of them, uh, but let me know what happens when you try them out. All right, any other questions on the 9mm? Because I kind of want to end off on that. I think it's a great lens. I would not hesitate to get this if you like that look and feel. If you're shooting things and you want to have a different viewpoint of products and spaces and things like that, I also think it can be great for establishing shots and things related to architectural spaces, outdoor spaces, and I've used that on a, uh, a gimbal, and if you do like a low-mode shot, it's really interesting, and because it's zero distortion, you're not getting that same viewpoint that you would get if you were using a fisheye lens, let's say if you were shooting skateboarding videos or things related to extreme sports and it just gives you a really nice clean look but at a very wide angle focal length and uh, again you're looking at something that's probably let's see let's do the math here really quickly ba -ba -ba, uh, you're nine millimeter and I would say yeah so you're at about a 13 and a half 
Um, yeah, to about a 14 and a half millimeter field of view equivalent to full frame 35 millimeter when you're using this lens. So even the 12 for full frame is even wider than, than that if you're using it on full frame. So pretty cool. If that made sense, I think it does. This is a nine millimeter made for crop sensor, which is gonna be somewhere between a 13 and a half to 14 and a half millimeter field of view equivalent to full frame. If you got the 12 millimeter version of their zero distortion lens for full frame cameras, you would be getting an even wider field of view. Um, obviously you can't use this on full frame because it's gonna be vignetting. There's not the glass to be able to fill that sensor or that film plane size. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. All right, what else do we have in terms of questions? Hit the chat up with questions or anything else. Please use an at the C47 if it's a question specifically for me. And uh, excited because as we're talking about questions, today's Cameron Flask at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern is gonna be your Q&A inside of the chat. So it's all gonna be about flaskers and everything else, so I'm excited about that. All right, so we're now gonna move on to and talk about another lens, which is this one right here, which is the Suray. And this is a very specialty lens. This is a 50 millimeter, inexpensive. I think it's coming in at about $700 now, uh, maybe $599 to $699 US dollars. 50 millimeter, 1.33 anamorphic lens. So this lens right here, is, and I apologize for the micro jitters there with the AF system, just because of the way I have it set up, is uh, obviously a much larger lens. It's a longer focal length. There's a lot of glass inside of here, and this is not an anamorphic adapter. I'm gonna talk a little bit about anamorphic lenses. It is an actual anamorphic lens, okay? So the reason that things look so funky there on the front of the lens is because basically what we're doing when we use an anamorphic lens is we're taking with optics the world and we're basically squashing more of the world into the captured image. That's one way of explaining it. I think it'll make sense once we go through everything. And I don't have a tremendous amount of experience shooting anamorphically. Uh, use more spherical lenses that are sort of the tried and true where a 50 is a 50, a 35 is a 35, a, you know, a, a 23 is a 23, but it's very different when you're using an anamorphic lens. So I'm gonna turn this camera on again, and I'm just gonna give you a little bit of feed because I took two shots, it's really video, but they look like photographs, yesterday um, with two lenses to sort of explain a little bit more about this concept. So let me just uh, get these ready for you and see if this makes sense. Great, okay. So I'm gonna feed this over to you. So this right here is essentially an uncorrected uh, capture of the 50 millimeter anamorphic lens. So just take a look at the field of view. Um, s things may seem a little squashed, um, and they are, and they will get stretched out later on. Um, and we can monitor that when we're shooting with the camera, which I'm also gonna to talk to you about. And, and then the next picture that we're gonna take a look at, the one that's following, is with just a straight 50 millimeter, a spherical lens, right? So this is just the 50 millimeter lens from Fujifilm. This is their weather resistant one. It's actually the one that's on the camera right now. And I'll go back again and we'll take a look at the 50 millimeter anamorphic. So you can see that the field of view is considerably different. Um, you may notice other slight differences in terms of characteristics, but I you know, just wanted you to see the differences there. You're also not seeing a focal length in terms of what is on the uh, anamorphic lens, but this anamorphic lens does open up to an f1.8. So it's a fast little lens for what we're doing. So let's talk about, again, what we're seeing here. So 
If we go back, whoops, that's the footage we were rolling on before. If we go back here to the 50 and we look at the field of view, this is a 50 millimeter lens on an APS-C sensor. And that's how much of the world we're going to see on a 50 millimeter lens. Now, there are variables, just so that you know. There's a little bit of a misconception. If you take a 50 millimeter lens, even a prime lens from Zeiss, and then you take a 50 millimeter lens from Canon and a 50 millimeter lens from Fujifilm, and you put them all onto the same camera system, uh, or let's say we say a 50 Sigma, a 50 uh, Sony, a 50 Canon, uh, 50 Zeiss, and you adapted all of those to, let's say, a Sony A7 series, and they were all full-frame uh, lenses. In theory, there's two things that you would expect. Number one, you would expect that the field of view would be identical because they're all 50 millimeter lenses. You would also expect that at a particular aperture, in terms of your iris opening up, let's just take f2, um, they would be all identical. And the, the, uh, the reality is they won't. There will be slight variations in terms of the field of view that you get, even though optically they're all 50 millimeter lenses and they should all match, they won't. And they may not be identical in terms of light transmission. They're supposed to be, but that's just not the way this world works, boys and girls. Um, but this, this is really, so what we're, what we're taking a look at here, and I'm just going to explain it to you here, and then we'll go back to the pictures, is what this lens is doing is because it's a 1.33x anamorphic lens, it's taking a 50 millimeter field of view of the world, and it's expanding how much of the world it can bring in. And if you do the math at 1.33x, you're getting about a 37 and a half millimeter field of view of the world. There's some variation there depending on the sensor from the particular manufacturer. Again, third part of this is APS-C and super 35 millimeter sensors, which are relatively similar in size, but not identical, are also varied between all of the manufacturers in terms of millimeters um, width and height. So. You just got to go with the flow. And that's why sometimes when you look at crop factor and you equate a lens's field of view to full frame, uh, 35, that sometimes it'll be times 1.5, sometimes it'll be times 1.6. That's because of the variations in terms of the sensor size. And they're still calling it APS-C, which is a essentially a, a film size that was and existed in the 90s, advanced photo system, and they were these film capsules that you would drop into APS-C cameras. And they would, um, if I remember correctly, well, you didn't, have to, you didn't have to, you know, thread them and load them the same way you would a standard 35 millimeter roll of film. They were drop in and then I believe you had a battery in there and it self-wind to the first picture that you were going to take. So it made the picture, the whole process pretty simple. Not that there weren't self-winding 35 millimeter cameras also that you did, but you'd have to get it on there first. So that's a that's a whole other story. Okay, so um, so your 50 millimeter field of view on this anamorphic lens, that's a 1.33x, is actually going to be a about a 37 and a half millimeter field of view of the world. So you're seeing more of the world in your final picture. There's other things that are gonna happen also in terms of cropping, aspect ratio, all of that stuff. But if, you, if you're if you looking at your, um, you know, your field of view this way of the world, you're getting more of the world in there. So, so that math, for instance, if you're also talking about anamorphic lenses and you're talking about some of the big suckers that are used on cameras, a 40 millimeter 2x anamorphic lens is going to double the field of view of the world. So your 40 millimeter anamorphic is going to see approximately 20 millimeters of the world. So your field of view is even wider. And because of the way these optics squash more of the world into the captured image, why do they squash it? Because they have to fit it onto that sensor. And then it gets stretched out. 
some interesting visual things start to happen in terms of the bokeh, out of focus areas of your image, in terms of flare, in terms of the way that lens reacts. I will say this right off the bat, when you're talking about a 1.33x anamorphic lens, you're not going to get the extreme look and feel that you're gonna get out of a 2X anamorphic. If you wanna know what 2X anamorphic lenses looks like, sorry, look like, um, just go watch some J.J. Abrams stuff. And especially, I, I think a great example of that that's just everywhere in the film would be Super 8. And you can also look at the first Star Trek reboot that he did. It's it's extreme in terms of how much you're looking at those flares and what's going on inside of there. Um, and it's a very interesting look when you're talking about anamorphic because generally what happens is when you shoot anamorphically, um, even when you start to stop down and you're not wide open, your sort of center portion of your image is going to be very much in focus, as long as you're in focus, and then you're going to see a fall off which is not vignetting, but it's just this sort of characteristic of the edges of the frame going um, out of focus, but in a very specific way to what you see with anamorphic lenses. Um, okay, so we've got this 50 on here. Let's go ahead and uh, turn the camera off for a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put on the 50 millimeter anamorphic. Uh, Adam, I'm glad you're here. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Six string Brian is in the house. Okay, let's talk about a couple other things here. Um, minimum focus distance is garbage compared to that nine millimeter lens. And this is a very different lens. So this is not a lens that you're gonna be shooting up close. I don't know on paper exactly what it is, but your minimum focus distance on this lens is, uh, I'm gonna say, at least a foot and a half away from your subject matter. Okay, so firing this up, and here we go. We've got the lens going. And again, remember, uh, 50 millimeter anamorphic giving you about 37 and a half millimeter uh, field of view. I'm gonna fire up the menus here. We're just gonna go over some housekeeping like we did before which is, now look, this may or may not be something that you wanna use, IBIS, but if you're hand holding and you're shooting 50 millimeter, it may make sense for you to turn on some sort of stabilization. The lens doesn't have any optical image stabilization. The reason we're seeing IBIS and IOS together is if you're on a Fujifilm camera and you're using a lens that has Optical image stabilization, you can use IBIS and OIS together. That's not unique to Fujifilm. Canon does similar stuff, other manufacturers, right? So um, let's also go in here, and I think I've set up my menu on here to do stuff. Have I set up? I have not. Um, well, let's maybe we'll do it, because I need it in here anyway. So is it screen set up? No. Look at this, you lazy boy, I'm not setting up. The, here we go, my menu for video, and I'm gonna add an item, and I'm gonna go over here, and I think I actually wanna go to the IQ section, and I'm gonna go in, and I'm gonna set mount adapter setting. Okay, good, so now that's been added to there, and that will be that item. And now if I go down into, this is sort of an aside here, but I go into my menu, if it lets me, what's going on here, kids? There we go. And I'm gonna go in and there's mount adapter settings. And what I wanna do is I wanna set that, this is a long way to get here, everybody, but I wanna set that to 50 millimeters because that's the focal length that I'm using. Um, and that's basically the first step that we have to take. The second step, and this is where it's really going to get messy, boys and girls, is when we get into talking about how we set this up for monitoring. Because unfortunately, this back screen here on the X-T4, and this is true of the X-T3 as well, 
Um, big advantage of the X-T4, of course, is the IBIS when you're shooting with a lens like this handheld is we can't properly monitor anamorphic using this little screen on the back of the camera. It's just not possible. It's not the way they set it up. Um, so what we can do is we can use an external monitor. Here I have the 503. You would not need a 503. You could absolutely use, if you weren't trying to do pass-through like I am, um, Atomos Shinobi, and you could use the small HD focus. Both of those will um, do anamorphic. But basically what you do is you go into your menus. Um, just I'm not going to do a close-up. Well, I don't think I can do a close-up. We'll see. I'm going to try something here. This is, again, where I said it's going to get messy, okay? <laughs> and, and I apologize if it is messy. I'm going to go to a different scene here inside of Ecamm. And it allows me to do a zoom and pan. It's actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Jeez, Louise. So I'm going to go into the menus. And inside of the setting menus here, if I scroll down, there is an anamorphic section. And I can change this from 1x, which would be what I would have it set to for spherical, to 133, 15, 166, uh, 2x. So I'm going to choose 133 and choose that, and you'll immediately see that change. So let me just go ahead and turn that back off and turn that back on, and you will see that change in terms of the anamorphic lens. Now, the thing that you need to remember here is that we are not changing. Let me just get out of this now that we've done it. We are not changing the recorded image, okay? That is not what's happening when we do this. I'm gonna switch over, sorry for the mic bump. We are changing our monitoring of the image when we do this with an external monitor. So our recorded image will still be that squozen anamorphic stuff. And when you get into your timeline in Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut Pro 10, you're going to have to set up that timeline properly for that 1.33x anamorphic footage. So um, for monitoring only, but it is giving you an accurate, essentially 239, 240, um, you know, aspect ratio in terms of what you're seeing with the the picture. And so it gives you confidence in terms of what it is you're doing in terms of framing, and you're not seeing this kind of stretched out the squozeny image with what you're going to be shooting with. And that definitely makes a difference in terms of what you're seeing. And again, just kind of going back to these images here, when we're looking at these images, and we are looking at the differences, we're not looking at a corrected version of what we're capturing anamorphically. This is basically what's going down and being captured to the sensor. And then what I did is I set it up so that I can monitor that and take a look at it in terms of what it's gonna look like when I bring it into a timeline. So let me see if I can just show you that quickly. I'm gonna to switch to a third feed here. Um, I don't know why it's not flipping, which is really annoying me, and I don't have it set up. It is supposed to be flipping, and it is flipping on my side, and I saw this yesterday. So I'm just gonna show it to you this way, and just for, for giggles. So there it is, and that's what it's gonna look like when we adjust for it in the timeline. And, um, and there you go. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense. And uh, Shiz, this is the HS2. This is just a headset mic. It allows me to move around the space and just have a little bit more mobility. I'm using it with the wireless go. So any questions on that before we then fire up and take a look at some of the characteristics of the lens and what those are? I'm waiting for anything. Another sip of espresso while you get a question in. Okay, cool. So let's do it. And you just let me know if you have any other questions. I'm just keeping my eye out on the chat. So we're going to go over here. 
I'm not going to go too far away and we'll just make some a little adjustments here and hopefully everything will work out just fine and I'm just popping this onto something and you can see here I am this is my A10 mini which is down here that's pretty far away from me that's a full arm's length that I'm touching it and I'm still not in focus at minimum focus distance. So I'm gonna back this off and try to give you a real sense. I probably actually have a tape measure in my, uh, in my drawer over here. And I'm still not at fully focused here. Now I've moved back and I'm right at about the focus point when it comes to that. Let me see if I've got a, uh, yep, I've got a tape measure here in the tape measure drawery. And from end of lens, we're talking about even more, two foot, five inches. We're talking about two foot, 10 inches to the sensor plane, approximately in terms of minimum focus distance. Is there anyone you would recommend to see the lens in action specifically on APS-C cameras? I haven't seen any, con well, there is some content out there. Uh, Cinema 5D has some stuff and things like that. So, for sure. Um, good. Uh, Shiz, I also have the skin tone one. This is the black version. But look, I got a dark beard, so it seems to work. Um, I could sing, but that was a long time ago. Okay, so let's go ahead and I've got some, um, of course I do. I've got some flashlights and things like that, and we can talk about some gotchas uh, related to that. So we don't say that kind of stuff here on the on the live streams. You're pushing it. Maybe Cameron Flask. I don't think so, though. All right, so let's turn off the key. We're going to make it a little bit moodier inside of here. It'll just also make it a little bit easier to be able to see some of the flares. And let's kill this little backlight as well. And then let's see what we've got in terms of our image. <clears throat> okay, good. Let me just see. Again, wow, yeah, it's pretty, pretty close in terms of our focusing. But I'm just going to get this pretty close. Yeah, I'm a little bit closer. Okay, so I'll, I'll, let it, I'll let it slide. But it's still, it's well over two feet in terms of minimum focus distance. And we just want to kind of take a look at this. We're not going to see, I mean, look, let me throw it out of focus so you can kind of see what the, the bokeh is like in terms of shape on this lens. And if this was a 2X anamorphic, it would be much more extreme in terms of what those out of focus areas would look like. I'll swing this around here so we can take a look at this. And if I, let's just drop the ISO. Ooh, look at that. <clears throat> if I boost the ISO, sorry for the mic bump you can start to see some of those flares happening that we would associate with anamorphic. And I'll get the flashlights in and stuff too. But let's also just kind of reduce the ISO here and throw this image out of focus. So you can start to see what some of those out of focus areas look like in terms of their shape. Um, so it's good to take a look at this kind of stuff when you are checking out and testing a lens. So let's just see, that's good enough. I think you guys get the, the basic idea. All right, so here we go. And we are gonna go back over to this little setup. And I'm also going to get focus on that. Maybe we'll come in just a little bit closer. Let's go ahead and pull that in. And I'm just gonna walk over to the chat just to see if there's any questions before I start grabbing some flashlights. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing I came over here, David. You didn't see through the camera, so let me switch. Uh, by the way, this is how you light in silhouette. So there you go. Just don't feed any light to the front. And I didn't switch, I know, I'm going to. So Shiz, we're, gonna, we're talking about the Suray 50 millimeter anamorphic earlier in the program. We talked about the nine millimeter uh, Lawa zero distortion lens. So if you didn't catch that, you can go and do a replay. All right, so we're set up in our space now. Let's rewind 
and we'll press play again, and I'll, I'll talk about all that other stuff that I talked about. And let me see. What is David saying here? There's lots of comments. Uh, oh, oh boy, here we go. All right, so now we're switching over to the actual feed from the camera system. And I'm going to show you exactly what I did uh, again so that we can start fresh. So I apologize. I told you it would be messy. So we're just going to go ahead and increase. And right now I'm at 25 ISO, 2500 ISO. And I'm going to turn the camera around. And we'll go over here to the, the bookcase here. And you can start to see as I'm, and I can really boost this here to 5,000, you can start to see some of the flare characteristics, which I'll show you more of later. But if I drop the ISO down and we take a look at this, we can sort of see that it's not completely unusual in terms of look and feel here, but it's also, um, you know, has a little bit of that anamorphic characteristic. And the feed that you're seeing is really the feed directly from the camera. So if I take my iPhone now, just to kind of show you again what this looks like here, and this is, it's kind of hard to do this, but we'll see if we can get it to sort of show you uh, a, a semi-accurate idea of what the anamorphic image looks like. Let me switch over to the phone and show you that. And again, I'm still not getting why it's not flipping. It was before. And let's try to see what, come on, drop that a little bit. It's trying to like sneak it into a bright part. There we go. So there it is. And it's just to show you it, it, its correct aspect ratio. It's also a little bit of a dirty lens, so not the best option here. But let's just go ahead and switch back over to the camera and take a look at this over here. And I'm also going to show you some out of focus areas when we just throw this out of focus. So you can kind of get a sense of the shape. They'll be a little bit wider on here. Let me show it to you again. I want you to get a sense of the difference between the captured image and the adjusted image. So here we go, oh, calculator for doing our stuff. Here we go, and okay, so this is what we're looking at on the back of the screen. Ah, here we go, I'll just use Filmic. I think everybody can see that, is that correct? Yeah, now we're, now we're cooking. Wrong program, I was going to the camera app, that's the reason why. So this is what the out of focus areas look like on the back of the Fujifilm, kind of the way they're being captured anamorphically. And you can see that they're kind of egg shaped, but look at what happens when I go over here to the adjusted image, and you can see that they start to stretch out a little bit more because we're at that wider aspect ratio. Does that make sense to everybody? Let's take a look at that. So this is kind of the, the back of the screen captured image purposely out of focus. And then this would be the adjusted image when we're stretching that out in terms of what's going on. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, and then what we're gonna do, let's go ahead and grab a couple of flashlights so I'm going to first fire up a little Lytra light, which is just multiple LEDs, and we'll turn that on. And we're going to start to flare the lens a little bit and start to see what happens with some of those characteristics in terms of how it's capturing and looking at that light and what it's doing, okay? But it's going to be, if you really want to flare a camera, and you can see here, those are pretty extreme, what you want to do is generally use a flashlight. So let's go ahead and use a flashlight here. Uh, this first little one right here, we're just going to go in and just start to bring in and take a look at some of the flare characteristics. I'm probably about four inches away from the lens. Now I'm about uh, a foot and a half away, and we'll take a look at what kind of flares we can get, and you'll see that those characteristics will 
still be there in similar ways, but they'll flare differently in terms of where they're coming from and how they're coming into the lens. This is kind of coming almost straight on, which you can see the front of the flashlight, and this is coming in more from the side. And I'm just moving that from the bottom to the top of the frame. And then I'm going to move over here to the other side and just flare from the camera left side so you can see some of that stuff and you can kind of see what's happening with the flares there and what they look like. And let's go ahead and take a larger flashlight. Also, I was noticing yesterday that when I was using one flashlight over the other, there was some flicker that was occurring um, with one of them because obviously the refresh rate was different. So just test your flashlights. If you're gonna force flares into an anamorphic lens, you definitely wanna test them. This is a larger flashlight. Um, it has a, a bigger beam that is being output. So you can kind of see what's happening with the flares there. And I'll just come in a little bit more from the side and again, run that up and down. Um, there you go. Make sense? So you can see some of that flare and what's happening. And, and that's again, coming sort of straight into the lens. Now we're crossing the lens, that's going directly in. And this is really some of the stuff that we associate with and we would not be getting um, exactly the same with a spherical lens. So let's go ahead and just quickly do a lens swap here. And I'm gonna put a, uh, for, for giggles here, I'm actually gonna put a lens that has a very similar field of view, if I can. Do I have, I do. I have a 35 millimeter lens. So this is gonna be a similar field of view of the world to the anamorphic lens. So I'm gonna, oh look, and you can do some fun uh, little lens whacking with anamorphics as well. And we'll put that on and we'll open that up. And this is a, a slightly wider field of view here. But there's a 35. I'm just going to walk that in a little. And you can sort of see what that looks like. And we'll throw it out of focus. You'll see that the out of focus areas are a little bit different. And I'll take that flashlight and I'll start to shine that into the lens. And take a look at the difference. I mean, that's, that's the flashlight right in the front. And I'm coming in from the side and I'm trying to get some of those same flares. And that's the type of flare that we would associate with a spherical lens as opposed to an anamorphic. Um, and I hope that is very clear. I mean, it's very apparent to me in terms of the difference as far as what we're seeing. And generally, we'd be shooting with this 35 millimeter lens for a 16 by nine aspect ratio or 17 by nine. We would not be shooting for a like a 239, 240. This is the other smaller flashlight here with a, a pointier angle. And we can get some flares, but they're the kinds of flares that we would normally associate with sunlight coming in or a bright light source coming into a lens. And those are minimized or they are greatly enhanced based on the design of, design of the lens and kind of what the manufacturer is trying to do. So let me go ahead and switch back to the studio space and we'll get the uh, the backlight back on and we'll get the key back on and then we'll wrap this sucker up uh there we go we're back okay so did that make sense did you see everything i apologize for not switching the first time a little bit of a brain fart. And by the way, just as a, an aside, while I'm looking to see if there's any last questions before we end the stream, uh, very ND, and this is attached to the front of the anamorphic lens, and that seems to work just fine. We're at a 50 millimeter focal length, and um, 72 millimeter is the thread size for the front of this lens. You can absolutely use ND, which is another, by the way, advantage to the nine millimeter that I spoke about at the top of the hour at the beginning of this live stream, is that unlike a fisheye lens, where you have a lens element that's sticking out from and you generally cannot 
put ND in front of that without a, um, uh, a map box, you can absolutely do that with that 9 millimeter lens, which is another big advantage. Of course, if you want fisheye and that's the look you're going for, you're going to have to get a fisheye lens. So any last questions regarding the 9 millimeter Laowa Venus Optics lens, the 0D distortion lens, or the 50 millimeter Suray? Uh, 1.33 X anamorphic. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Dom, the very ND I'm using on there is a pretty cheap one. It's actually a Polaroid one. I generally use Tiffin filters. This one I just picked up when I had this lens come in because I wanted to have a 72 millimeter that was inexpensive while I tested it. It's um, it's okay. It's not bad, it's inexpensive, and it seems to work just fine. Not totally neutral in terms of stuff, but I think that it's, uh, it's an okay ND. But again, I would look at some of the other ones on the market. Um, you know, some of the higher end Tiffin ones I like for sure. Uh, David, is there something that would work on the C200 that's similar? And David, is that question related to anamorphic lenses? Um, if it is anamorphic, there are some anamorphic lenses that you can use, but generally those are for the newer C500 Mark II, the C300 Mark III. Not a lot of anamorphics going on unless you're doing anamorphic adapters for the um, the other cameras there. And, and a lot of people who are shooting anamorphic when we're talking about high-end cameras are doing that on sensors that are not a 17 by 9 aspect ratio so they're um you know they're uh four three i believe they shoot open gate and they do that again anamorphic is not my my wheelhouse it's not an area it's really i'm dipping my toes into it right now um i would do a search for anamorphic c200 remember that it is a 17 by 9 aspect ratio sensor and one of the advantages to shooting anamorphic on um, the C500 Mark II is it's essentially a 6K sensor. And even if you're finishing in 4K, you're going to have to do quite a bit of uh, scaling and cropping if you are not using a full-frame anamorphic lens. And most of them are Super 35 millimeter that are on the market right now. So it's going to need that additional resolution if you want to resolve to 4K without image quality loss. So I'm saying a lot there, but that's just something that you have to think about. Um, yeah, so I think we're getting near the end, kids. We've covered a lot. Some of it was just as messy as I thought it would be. Some of it was a little less messy and kind of worked itself out. Realized that I kept launching the camera app, and that's why it was having a problem turning the image and giving you a full view, which is why I use Filmic Pro as my feed from the phone when I want to show everybody things in terms of what's going on here in the quote-unquote studio space. Uh, we have Cameron Flask coming up at 3 p.m., Pacific time, grab your leaded or unleaded drinks. It's going to be questions from you. So if you want to submit questions that are going to get put into the lineup and not put them into the chat, you can go to either the c47.com and fill out the contact form with your question. You can email questions at the c47.com. We already have one that's in from a regular viewer, and we'll see everybody later on. Hopefully these little hours of time to learn and discuss are also important with everything else that's going on in the world. They're not more important, but we have to continue being creators and content creators and getting better at our craft and what we do. So um, I'm here to answer questions if I know the answers, and if I don't, um, usually I'll go find the answer for you. So thank you very much for coming to this particular live stream. And I know, again, there's a lot of people who are going to watch this on replay. 
So make sure you know that at the beginning, uh, well, you're going to watch it from the beginning, so I don't even need to say it. Everybody stay safe, everybody be well, and I will see everybody in a few hours who comes back for Cameron Flask. Take care.